Good afternoon, and welcome to your own health and fitness talk show. I'm um, health integration specialist Lena Berman, and I'm here live with you every Tuesday at noon, talking to you about healthcare and fitness trends and taking your phone calls. This week's show is an interview with biologist, researcher, and medical activist Raymond Pete. He's the true pioneer of the use and of supplemental natural progesterone, among other things. Um, And as usual, I will open up the phone lines at 12.30 at 510-848-4425 for your participation. Uh, I want to remind people, if you'd like to get a tape of today's show or you need to get hold of me after the show, you can call my office during normal business hours, and that number is 707-769-1458. I don't uh, actually want to do much of an editorial today um, because I I have a lot to discuss with uh, Dr. Pete and I want to get right into the show. Uh, But I'd like to give you uh, some information about why why the show is so important to me and um, why I chose uh, uh, Dr. Pete to come on the air with us today. Um, It was roughly 15 years ago I went to a lecture, a small talk actually at at UCSF and uh, Ray Pete was there speaking. And... um, He spoke uh, a bit about, among other things, some research that had been done uh, on the topic of helplessness in using animals. It was unfortunate. I mean, animal rights people would not like this research. But they had uh, uh, done an experiment that proved that when animals were made to feel helpless, they lost the will to live. Um, And he was discussing this in the context of how it affects patients who are caught in a chronic illness cycle and are in a cycle of being treated constantly and being dependent on treatment. Um, He also spoke about the use of natural progesterone and thyroid medication as uh, things that excite the cells and help the body to pull out of an inhibitory state. Um, His work is very controversial, although some of the things, many of the things, most of the things that he said that I heard 15 years ago now are considered sort of the new wave of information um, in somewhat alternative health, although even in mainstream health, some of the swings that we've made from polyunsaturated oils to recognizing the use of saturated fats for cooking and various things. Um, And certainly the use of progesterone, natural progesterone and uh, thyroid medication and the problem that people are having with thyroid. So Um, I have chosen to do a show with him, and I want you to understand that you may find a lot of what he has to say confusing and controversial, but I want you to maintain an open mind, as I do with him at all times, and uh, consider what he has to say and try it on for yourself. Um, As with all of the shows that I do, I want you to think for yourself, but it's a rare opportunity to have Dr. Pete available to us and I think that he's a very important researcher, and I think you ought to listen carefully to what he has to say. Uh, in ways of an introduction, Raymond Pete has a doctorate in biology from University of Oregon with a specialization in physiology. His books include Mind and Tissue, Progesterone in Orthomolecular Medicine, Nutrition for Women and Generative Energy. He's taught at the University of Oregon, Urbana College, Montana State University, National College of Naturopathic Medicine, Universidad de Veracruz, Ana, and the Universidad uh, Autónoma del Estado de México. He founded a Blake College, which is an international university. Uh, Dr. Pete, in addition, does independent research, continues to do it, thank goodness for all of us, and private endocrine and nutritional counseling. Some of you uh, have just been introduced to Dr. Pete because he's mentioned in Dr. John Lee's book, uh, What Your Doctor May Not Know About Menopause, as uh, Dr. Lee's inspiration for his research on natural progesterone. So, without any further delay, I'd like to welcome you to the show. Are you there, Ray? Yeah, yeah, hi. Hi. Thanks so much for taking the time. I thought that was a good context you created talking about the helplessness thing because um, since Dr. Lee's book came out, I've been hearing from people who say, I just want progesterone for my bones or whatever, and... I think the real meaning of any of these natural sup- supplements or substances is that they participate in everything. Their physiology and ecology 
are are tied together in a system, and these things are important because they're sort of central links in this ecological, physiological system. But even inside the perception of power or helplessness can make a tremendous difference in how these hormones work. And when people think of them as products or drugs, uh, they are almost certain to misuse them in some way. Well, I, I, the reason I brought up the, the research on helplessness is because essentially hearing the lecture that you gave let me out of a cage. Um, and I had a completely different view of my health after that. And it, was a, it really had a profound effect on me. Um, I think it's a good segue to talk about what you talk about when you talk about an inhibitory state, which is the same as what you just started to say, so that I want you to talk about the fact that we're not just talking about progesterone, we're talking about the way, for instance, our modern diet has suppressed thyroid function and the way that all of these systems work together. Um, the idea of the inhibitory state um, comes largely from the Pavlovian tradition and Pavlov saw uh, three basic biological states, uh, one in which you were so well-rested and prepared that you could respond to challenges without being stressed, and the other, in, uh, that was high inhibition, readiness, and the low state of being inhibited is sort of protection against uh, overstimulation. And in between is the range of stress, and energy is needed to put us up into the readiness state where we're relaxed and able to cope with without experiencing the stress reaction. And we think of cortisol and the glucocorticoids as the central stress handling hormones, but the brain is set up such that ACTH, which turns on the adrenal hormones such as cortisol, ACTH is produced in response to a substance which is only produced when we're deficient in pregnenolone and thyroid, the precursor materials, and so that when you're in that replenished state with enough pregnenolone, you don't even resort to the stress reaction. Um, that's the latest biological meaning of the high state of inhibition or readiness. So, so to, to, to make it accessible to people who are listening, um, many of us uh, you know, have been, as, as we often like to say, running on adrenaline instead of, of uh, something more sustaining. And uh, there's a, a lot of adrenal exhaustion in people with autoimmune diseases and whatnot. Um, so part of what happens is there's a wheel, and somewhere along the line you have to be able to stick a stick in the wheel to make it stop. What is the stick? What's the first stick? Um, adequate protein and sodium are very crucial um, for the average American. Um, adequate high-quality protein is needed before your liver can regulate your blood sugar and all of the hormones. And without that, you tend to waste your minerals, and sodium is a, is a key mineral. And so people who are on low-protein and low-sodium diets are doing exactly what uh, puts them into the stress situation. And as I understand, there are foods um, that you believe suppress thyroid function, which is another key to this, yes? Yeah, these um, low-sodium and low-thyroid are sort of basic um, things to think about, but the, there's a whole layer of American foods, and uh, they're, they're worldwide poisons. You can see belts of uh, thyroid disease and tuberculosis, for example, wherever people eat too much cabbage or too many beans and lentils. Uh, these foods are the classical, traditional uh, thyroid inhibitors, but chemically, um, it's the essential fatty acid, <laughs> <laughs> so-called the unsaturated fats that are becoming very important to Americans and thyroid 
and progesterone function. Okay. Well, the, the reason I'm la- well, the reason both of us are laughing is because we've had no end of conversations about essential fatty acids because I uh, I don't know how I feel about this. I'm I'm rather alarmed by what Raymond is saying, but I'm confused because when you go to bio, the, at least what I've seen in biochemical and nutrition textbooks, they say that you know the the premise I think that Ray is talking about is that saturated fat will turn into essential fat. But my understanding is that saturated oil can't turn into long-chain omega-3s and that although Paleolithic meat had it in it because the animals were eating leafy greens, since we're now eating corn-fed meat, uh, we, we're not going to get it outside. of um, Omega-3 and omega-6 are the things that people are currently conscious of because of a vast marketing campaign that has been going on for 40 years. But when we aren't given these things, which inhibit these external unsaturated fats, inhibit our own enzyme system, and when we are not saturated with these enzyme inhibitors, our own cells produce omega-9 unsaturated fatty acids, uh, coconut oil and olive oil, are very similar to what the uh, baby produces when it's not when it's relatively insulated. And if you take cells and grow them in culture, they grow wonderfully in a completely unsaturated oil-free culture medium, uh, showing that human cells, whether in the developing fetus or in the laboratory dish, do a fine job of producing unsaturated fats um, and, in fact, have more cellular vitality than when they are exposed to these environmental oils. Okay. Well, just again, to make it accessible, um, what you're really saying is to stay away from vegetable oils, correct? Yeah. Um, For example, the degree of unsaturation, uh, linolenic with three double bonds, or linoleic acid with two double bonds, uh, in proportion to the number of double bonds, they poison the thyroid function at every known level. Uh, The synthesis, the transport, and the response in two or three different ways inside the cells um, are strongly poisoned by the three unsaturated groups and um, significantly inhibited by the two uh, double bonds of linoleic acid. I told you guys this would be uh, going against everything else you've been hearing, and truly it is. Um, We're going to run out of time, and one of the things I want to make sure we go over is that um, I think what we've just said is that eating unsaturated, uh, polyunsaturated oils is, is thyroid inhibitory. Not eating enough protein also inhibits thyroid function, and Uh, Don't you also believe that grains do the same thing? Well, uh, the whole grains contain a variety of toxins that are put there to protect the uh, next generation of the plants. The the plants put their worst poisons in their seeds and the next level of uh, toxicity in their leaves to prevent bugs and grazers uh, from killing them. Uh, Fruits and roots are where the vegetable matter is least toxic, but the unsaturated oils in the seeds are part of the cells, the the plant's defense against being eaten and digested. Okay. So so when we start to talk about being careful what you eat because it may inhibit your thyroid function, the reason we're saying that is because even people who are testing normal for thyroid function but have cold hands and have below normal temperatures and maybe are just slightly low in thyroid function um, often also are estrogen dominant, uh, and this includes some men. <laughs> as, as your thyroid goes down, your estrogen comes up. It's a very neat connection, which is because your liver needs both protein and thyroid to get rid of estrogen, and when your liver function decreases, your estrogen automatically piles up 
Okay. Just a quick <clears throat> ID for the show. This is your own health and fitness. I'm uh, health integration specialist Lena Berman, and I'm on the phone with um, biologist and med I would say medical. I'd like to call you a medical advocate, uh, ad activist, Raymond Pete, who um, is a rare guest and a very important guest. And we're talking about the relationship between a diet and the, the various hormones and steroids that exist in our bodies, including thyroid and progesterone. We'll open up the phone lines maybe at 12:30. I may I may actually extend the interview a little bit. Let's see how we how we do. Um, so so what happens when you're throwing off the estrogen balance in the body? And again, to remind people, this is not just women. This is men, and particularly because we're living in an environment with a lot of xenoestrogens and foods that have estrogen, like like soy. This can happen uh, in men as well. Uh, this leaves us susceptible. Am I right to autoimmune uh, dysfunction? Yeah, um, there are several good books available on the role of estrogen in autoimmune diseases. It's uh, very central to autoimmune degenerative diseases. In our hamster lab many years ago, some of the researchers saw that estrogen first causes overdevelopment of the adrenal cortex in the animals and as they increased the dose, it reached the point that it killed the adrenal cells. Mm -hmm. it, um, it, in essence, is a stress hormone. Hans Selye, in the 1940s, yes. described it as the shock hormone. It imitates everything of shock and stress. Yeah, because it, it, it's, this, it's this sort of line of thinking, I think, the end reading. Uh, you know, I was going to ask you about you know where where you're looking what research you've been looking at that brings up this stuff about polyunsaturated oils because in many of our conversations you've said this research is very old about the carcinogenic the potential carcinogenic effect of polyunsaturates yeah the oldest study was that i know of was 1927 in germany in which they showed that fat a, a fat free diet in rats caused them to be essentially free of spontaneous cancer and just in the last several years, uh, researchers have demonstrated that as you increase the amount of unsaturated oil in the diet, there's almost a straight line associated increase of the development of cancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so saturated fat apparently doesn't do this in your estimation? Uh, no, and okay. saturated fat is, for many years, it's known to um, be um, pro-immunity. Yeah, of course, there's all this stuff about heart disease that everybody's getting excited about, though, and people do, well, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> the Broda Barnes books on heart disease are probably the best introduction to this, even though the uh, Shute family started in the 1930s showing how estrogen promotes blood clots. But uh, uh, Broda Barnes' work shows that low thyroid which, of course, is caused by too much unsaturated fats, is the main cause for degenerative circulatory disease. And the research of just the last few years is showing that, in fact, unsaturated fats are highly atherogenic. Uh, the free radical reaction, which is developed in thyroid-deficient animals, causes the blood vessels to be the first site of attack as these unsaturated fats are either eaten or drawn out of the fat storage tissues. Uh, they are exposed to oxygen in the bloodstream, produce free radicals, and uh, attack the lining of the blood vessels. Just to, again, to break this down for people, what we're talking about is a real hunter-gatherer diet. That's what we're talking about, is eating a very strict hunter-gatherer diet that is um, probably 40% protein and includes uh, probably some cooked uh, vegetables, well-cooked, and uh, tubers, uh, potatoes, and um, fruit. But uh, let's go back to uh, progesterone, because um, you're really quite famous for this now, and talk about the link and how progesterone works to help with this, again, to put a stick in the wheel. Okay, the, uh, the reason cholesterol is high in low thyroid people, and this was neatly established in the 1930s that they took high cholesterol to be diagnostic of 
low thyroid because you can demonstrate such a neat up and down relationship. For example, a month ago I saw two people who wanted to pass a, a health test in a few days, lower their cholesterol 200 points in about three or four days um, just by adjusting their thyroid. Uh, so thyroid is what makes you regulate your cholesterol, but it does it largely by turning cholesterol into steroids, um, starting with pregnenolone and uh, pre progesterone being one of the major uh, products, so that if you have adequate thyroid and cholesterol and vitamin A, your cholesterol is going to be turned efficiently into progesterone. And these are the hormones that prevent the stress reaction um, that involves cortisone and adrenaline. Okay, well, that's a big if, because for many of us, even those of us who, I mean, as we've talked about before, there are many people who already have autoimmune disease, uh, and maybe you're supplementing with thyroid now. So part of this has to do with supplementation of thyroid and progesterone because this sort of mechanism of getting well again after the damage has been done is, is a slow one, no? Yeah, uh, and the unsaturated fats also poison the, for example, ovaries and brain cells directly. I, I just and hate it when you talk this way. <laughs> make me nuts. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, the, uh, there are other things such as iron overload or unsaturated fat excess or vitamin E deficiencies that poison the progesterone producing cells, but the basic thing is having enough cholesterol, vitamin A, and thyroid to produce these uh, protective hormones. Okay, so some people are starting to take extra supplemental thyroid. Again, I'm looking at trying to stop the wheel, and people are introducing uh, natural progesterone as a supplement to help the absorption of the thyroid and to lower, you know, to contest the estrogen. Am I, am I yeah, okay? Yeah, pro progesterone facilitates function of the thyroid gland, and that is a potential side effect of taking progesterone because everyone who's low in progesterone is going to have some kind of thyroid malfunction because the thyroid is blocked in its function by estrogen and activated by progesterone. So if it has been blocked and has a, a store of hormone, when you take progesterone, sometimes it starts the thyroid working too fast as it unloads this um, bulk. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then, then we've got people who are getting older. Okay. Now first, we've got people who maybe are even really young that are still having trouble with the thyroid being inhibited and, and the autoimmune diseases, and, the, 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 and they're taking progesterone, and this is, again, we can, men can take this as well, no? Mm -hmm. uh, then we start to get people who are uh, uh, getting middle-aged, and things start to change, and that's when I think you like people to consider if they're ill, or maybe not only ill, to consider supplementing with pregnenolone. And, um, you know, I asked, uh, I think I told you, I asked Michael Colgan, who is a, a sports nutrition specialist, about pregnenolone. He went, oh, no, it makes, you know, makes cortisol, and people who are exercising will make cortisol, and well, that won't be good. So tell me, let's tell everybody well, about that. The one hormonal effect that has been seen consistently, and uh, it's the only thing that shows up in when you study um, animals or people, who are given pregnenolone. The only hormonal consequence is that if their cortisone is elevated, pregnenolone brings it down to normal. That's because the elevation of cortisol is connected through mechanisms in the brain circuitry. Um, high cortisol is a symptom of a pregnenolone deficiency. And once you get your cortisone down by having enough pregnenolone, then any amount of pregnenolone you take has no hormonal action whatsoever. But you need to be saturated, otherwise you uh, are going to resort to cortisone. And cortisone is a basic thing that ages the skin, the brain cells, the bones. Um, every cell is aged faster under the influence of cortisone. Okay. 
And then uh, pregnenolone usually advise people after 50 to, to do. Um, incidentally, just to let you know, I am going to go long on this interview. I'm, what I'll do is I'll still break at 12.30 for about 30 seconds. And you guys who are listening who want to call in, please try to maybe write to me a question sound because we'll probably have to move quickly through the calls. And then when we come back from break, I'm going to go ahead with the interview for maybe another 10 minutes because there's several things I want to sort of go through with Ray before I open up the phone lines. So start listing your questions down so we can move through them quickly. Um, uh, pregnant alone after 50. Now, now we've got the, the vitamin companies are pushing DHEA. So why don't you explain how that fits in? Okay. Pregnant alone turns into either progesterone or DHEA. And DHEA happens to be close to testosterone and estrogen. It's in the sex hormone pathway. And progesterone happens to be in the uh, adrenal pathway. It's the main protection. It's a very powerful protection against all of the adrenal hormones um, so that you, could, you don't even need your adrenal glands Hans Selye demonstrated that the adrenals can be removed and the animal is happy and lives its full lifespan if given progesterone. So progesterone is necessary to make the adrenal hormones, but it, it's the basic protection against an excess of them. So uh, these two pathways are both kept supplied by pregnenolone. And, uh, you know, I'm not, t I'm telling, especially women, to sort of stay clear of DHEA because I think that that's the wrong step in the yeah. pathway. I knew a, a middle-aged man who was taking DHEA and had his, his liver was expanding so large I had him uh, get his estrogen measured. And his estrogen was high for a young woman. Oh, dear. And a few days after he stopped the DHEA, his estrogen level was down to normal, but his liver now, a year later, is still like a watermelon. And in rat studies, um, DHEA is highly carcinogenic to the liver. It mm -hmm. stimulates first enlargement of the liver and sometimes shrinkage of the thymus because of its overflow into the uh, thymolytic sex hormones, estrogen and testosterone. But it is um, chronically a great risk of liver cancer. So so the way to encourage production of it would be after 50 or so, people who, who want to can supplement with pregnenolone instead? Yeah, and if you have adequate cholesterol, uh, I think of people as being lucky if they have a cholesterol of 250 because oh that means all they have to do is take thyroid until they have brought their cholesterol down um, to about 170 or so. And at that point, the abundance of cholesterol is a great benefit because it makes them able to produce pregnenolone and progesterone mm -hmm. and DHEA. Okay, that makes a lot of sense, actually. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break in a moment here, uh, but w when we come back, what I want to ask you about is, is men and progesterone. Also, I want to make something clear to people. We're talking about natural progesterone, not progestins, not pharmaceutically altered hormones that are sold by pharmaceutical companies and patented that are changed. We're talking about natural progesterone that is synthesized still from natural sources, but not changed, not altered. And we'll talk about some sources of that when we get back. So let me take a brief musical break. When we come back, I'm going to continue the interview for another 10 minutes or so. At about 1240, I'll open up the phone lines. This is your own health and fitness talk show. I'm Lena Berman on the phone with Dr. Raymond Pete. We'll be right back.
Welcome back. Welcome back. This is your own health and fitness talk show. I'm Lane Berman, health integration specialist. I'm on the phone with uh, Dr. Raymond Peet, a biologist and researcher. I'm holding off on opening the phone lines for another 10 minutes because we have an awful lot to talk about. And about, at about 1240, I'll open them up. Uh, Raymond, um, we were talking about uh, pregnenolone, and I'd like to move to progesterone, natural progesterone, in its use for men. And also, you discovered that it's good for the relief of migraine headaches. Yeah, it's um, Hans Selye um, discovered all of the basic properties of progesterone, I think. Uh, his technicians reported that they had killed all of his rats in one experiment with progesterone, and he said he couldn't believe that, and he fished the dead rats out of the garbage and found that they were just profoundly anesthetized. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it turns out that when healthy animals are in their last day or two of pregnancy, people have put them on electrified floors and they don't even notice that they're being shocked because the progesterone that's naturally present for childbirth is putting them in a a literally anesthetized state even though they're apparently happy and moving around. Yeah, don't try this at home, people. (laughs) uh, Most of the progesterone that has been researched in humans, uh, the maximum doses they give injecting 6,000 milligrams, for example, made people drowsy but never put them into a, an actual anesthetic unconsciousness. But that's because the uh, solvents um, drop crystals of progesterone when you inject it, or if you take the powder, it doesn't dissolve in ordinary oils. But If you take it dissolved in vitamin E, so it actually gets into the bloodstream, um, the progesterone has this um, rising um, series of effects, which at the peak is a highly protected but anesthetized condition. Short of that state, it protects against um, harmful stimuli, for example, the, uh, some of the amino acids are called excitotoxic amino acids, and the basic protection against these, which are normal brain transmitters, but they happen to excite brain cells to death. The, the brain's normal protection against cell death produced by these ordinary transmitters is progesterone, and to some extent pregnenolone does the same thing. They are the only two hormones that work with the other transmitter called GABA, which uh, Mm -hmm. puts the brain in a protected resting state and uh, prevents the the stress damage. Okay, so what we've we've done a segue here, instead of talking about men and progesterone, what we've talked about is that it's not possible really to overdose uh, overdose, on, on progesterone. Although, you know, one of the questions that came up for me is why can't you become progesterone dominant? Well, on on the way up the scale towards protecting everything. Um, It's also protective against salt imbalance and imbalance of the sex steroids. And that means that it protects your thymus and immune system against destruction by the stress hormones or the sex hormones. So it's extremely important in the sense of being protective, but it also neutralizes the male hormone. Mm -hmm. And so this is at a very low level in man, it begins to neutralize the testosterone. Okay. And so a man wants to be conscious that there is this steadily rising protective function. And uh, if they don't want to be protected against having whiskers and other typically male traits, uh, they don't want to take more than just a very few milligrams a day, two or three milligrams a day is, is about enough to um, offer general protection without neutralizing them sexually. Oh, I didn't think it had any feminizing effects. No, it isn't feminine. Well, mm. feminizing in the sense of not being uh, either estrogen affected or testosterone affected. Oh, that's interesting because I thought it did. I thought when women took progesterone that it does increase their testosterone levels. No. Oh, well, why, did, it, why does the libido come back then in women? Well, who are because having... the estrogen as a shock hormone um, causes 
protective loss of libido at, at some point, and by stopping that shock reaction, uh, the libido comes back. And okay. men can still function even with their testosterone highly neutralized, so they they feel like they've just come out of a, a cold shower, but uh, the, the brain still knows how to make everything function. This would be nasty, though. If the woman is taking progesterone and the man's taking too much, it could get really ugly. Well, it doesn't uh, really prevent potency. Uh, it, uh, well, it's... just interest, I would think, after a cold shower. Um, so, but, but it sounds like taking a very small amount of progesterone for men will be protection against maybe something that we loosely call andropause or male menopause and prostatitis and prostate disease. Yeah, and it, it has been used uh, largely in Europe um, to shrink enlarged prostate. And I've seen it happen uh, at a very moderate dose that doesn't even affect their sexuality. It'll uh, shrink an enlarged prostate. Okay. A couple of quick things. Um, I think what we're saying, oh, you, so what you're saying about the headaches is it, it, it's an, it has an anesthetic effect. Yeah, and okay. it um, stops the vascular problems that are involved in the blind spots of migraine. Uh, okay. I, in two of my worst migraines ever, I found that in a minute and a half, the headache totally resolved. Um, and in women, it is less likely to have such a quick, massive effect because women are likely to have a much higher estrogen level. Estrogen causes nerve um, sensitivities, which can culminate in epilepsy, but uh, migraine is a lower grade of this estrogen poisoning. And the effect on the vascular system of progesterone is in the direction of digitalis. It's considered to be the body's own heart and circulation regulatory substance, mm -hmm. which is affected by digitalis. And this means that it tones up, for example, varicose veins or bulging veins on the backs of your hands are a, an easy way to see a progesterone deficiency. But that's what happens in a migraine, the bulging veins impair circulation. Ray, very quickly, um, do you completely disapprove of ever supplementing with estrogen if women have vaginal atrophy and stuff like that? Uh, yeah, because of the side effects. There there must be a lot of other hormones that people could research without going right to the most dangerous shock hormone, estrogen. So, um, so your sense is that if women are having those, even with progesterone yeah, research, supplementation? Researchers have found that vitamin A and progesterone and, and even DHEA, uh, very often it seems to be the missing factor. Okay, now you're confusing people. So you're saying after menopause, when women are experiencing uh, maybe some specific symptoms intervaginally, that rather than use estrogen, that in that situation maybe DHEA is appropriate? What about well, testosterone? Or? Yeah, there, people have been researching all of those, and all of them seem to uh, affect at least some of the women. And so I think it's better to check them out in the order of safety, like with pregnenolone, thyroid oh. progesterone first right. and right, then, that makes sense. then try as your last resort. That's right. Try the one that tends to kill you sooner. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So thyroid and pregnenolone first. That makes sense. Um, you've uh, had some success treating Graves' disease with pregnenolone. I mean, they're irradiating people's thyroids for yeah. Graves. Um, if there's published stuff um, using what I consider mild doses of pregnenolone. All of their people, the eyes receded and... Uh, in my few experiences, the eyes just sort of were sucked back into the head. It's, it's such a dramatic process that uh, you have to see what it can do to uh, deformed arthritic joints or emphysema in which there's n almost no oxygen getting through the lungs or in this state of Graves' disease in which there's a gelatinous material behind the eyeball. Uh, the valves of the heart can get this same gelatinous deposit, which is it, historically it's thought of as a low thyroid uh, product, a glycoprotein. But pregnenolone has the most dramatic, almost instantaneous effect. Like in an hour, you can see results. Okay. Um, what I want people to do is to make sure you've got a pencil and paper because I want Ray to give out 
his P.O. box number and his address. I'm sorry, his P.O. box number. And if you'd like to, Ray, also your phone number in a second, because you actually make an oil, which is the vitamin E oil with progesterone, which is much stronger than the creams that are available on the market. Um, and I think it's a very effective way of supplementing for progesterone, and it's easily gotten by ordering it from you by mail, including all of your books, which are self-published and available by ordering them from you by mail. But you know what? You never send a protocol with your progesterone oil, so I'm getting no end of phone calls. <laughs> yeah, people should read the book and become their own expert because, like I said at the beginning, it's always individual, and progesterone is just one of the central factors but, in a whole yeah. physiological, ecological problem. And usually you can fix the problem with diet, and if not just diet, then thyroid. And I think of progesterone just as one of the um, first aids in repairing the problem, but not the answer. Okay, so the book being Progesterone in Orthomolecular Medicine, but given that people should use their body and their understanding to help to treat themselves, how much progesterone is in, say, uh, an eighth of a teaspoon of your oil? Uh, 50 milligrams, but you can't think in terms of what doctors often talk about because that's enough to make some people a little bit drunk. Okay. Uh, that's three times the normal day's dose. Okay, so maybe a sixteenth of a teaspoon yeah. is a better starting dose. Yeah. And um, how much vitamin E is in that dose? Well, the solvent is vitamin E. It's 90% of, of the quantity. And so if you have um, 25 milligrams of substance, mm -hmm. it's um, going to be about uh, uh, 200 units of vitamin E. Great. Oh, I'm so glad to know this now. You have no idea how many phone calls I get on this. <laughs> All right. Your P.O. box and your phone number. P.O. box 5764. 5764. Eugene, Oregon, 97405. Okay. And do you want to give out your phone number? Uh, to no. You. No? No. Okay, so if people want to do a consultation with you? Yeah, they can write to the uh, post office box. P.O. Uh, box 5764, Eugene, Oregon, 97405. And you also have a newsletter, which is $24 for 12 issues. Mm -hmm a year, and um, you can, I, I assume, send people information on how much each book costs. And Yeah. Okay. I also have a list of the books and the P.O. box at the front desk of KPFA, so people, after the show, if you get confused, can call 510-848-6767 to get some of the information we just gave out, you know, the P.O. box. All right, I am going to open up the phone lines at long last for those of you who have been waiting patiently. Um, this is your own health and fitness talk show. I'm health integration specialist, Lena Berman, and I've been on the phone for the last 45 minutes, um, it's been very luxurious with Raymond Peet, Ph.D., a biologist and researcher. We're going to open up the phone lines now at 510-848-4425. Again, 510-848-4425. Please remember to turn your radio down before we pick you up. And let's move to our first caller. Caller, you're on the air with your own health and fitness. Um, yeah, I was curious about how much uh, progesterone you need to take to treat migraine headaches because I have been getting them and uh, I do think they're hormonally related. Uh, like I said, the problem is to balance the estrogen and it's hard to tell how much estrogen a woman has to balance and so a dose that would uh, not touch a headache in one person might make the other one uh, so drunk they couldn't walk for several hours. So uh, I would say not to try more than uh, 50 milligrams at a dose, but then repeat it every 15 minutes until the headache is gone. And the efficient way to prevent them is to take thyroid or optimize your own thyroid production so that your estrogen is controlled to a reasonable degree. And then it takes little or no progesterone because uh, the, the estrogen is... Um, able to be controlled. Okay, caller, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, you've also mentioned Broderbarn's books, but they are, in fact, out of print. Am I right? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so maybe libraries, Broderbarn, B-R-O-D-E-R, B-A-R-N? Uh, B-R-O-D-A was his first name, B-A-R-N-E-S. B-R-O-D-A-B-A-R-N-E-S, Broderbarn's, maybe in the library. 
Okay, let's move to another caller. Caller, you're on the air with KPFA. Uh, yes. Um, I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's disease. Along with everybody else in the Six world. months ago with a, this astronomically high uh, level of thyroid antibodies. I have no symptoms which are can clearly be traced to it, and uh, I'm now, you know, reached a dose of Synthroid, which is, you know, balances out my blood tests, but uh, there's, there's no change in the way that I feel. You know, the, mm-hmm. there's a lot of history involved here, but in the practical point that I've seen is that, for example, any tissue which is injured, uh, like they have experimentally twisted a piece of cartilage and found that just that small amount of disruption causes it to raise antibodies from its own body. And so any tissue which is under stress is going to have antibodies as part of a cleanup process. So don't worry about the diagnosis or the antibodies because everyone who corrects their thyroid function that I've seen has corrected their antibody level after about a year of good functioning. But the the real problem is that in the 1940s, it was known that almost half of Americans were hypothyroid and got over their symptoms, whether it was diabetes or heart disease or infections, when they were given adequate thyroid. But a drug company came out with the test for protein-bound iodine in the blood, and they found that 95% of the population had enough of that and so were not hypothyroid. And that indoctrinated the whole country to believe that only 5% of the population is really hypothyroid. But in the 60s, it turned out that that test was complete nonsense. It didn't measure anything of significance. But what stuck was the doctrine that 95% of the people are not hypothyroid. And the synthroid-type thyroxin was tested in the 1940s on young male medical students who were healthy and they said oh it works just like thyroid but the fact is that it was not tested on women and women because of the high estrogen that is uh, exaggerated by low thyroid women who are low thyroid have almost a complete inability to respond to thyroxin because it has to be activated by the liver and over and over I see women who get more and more hypothyroid as they take more and more thyroxin and sometimes this happens in men sometimes men can respond because their livers are not as poisoned by estrogen That's, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to do this Ray but you know I actually know a lot of people who taking a combination of medications including some synthroid have done really well so I don't know. <clears throat> well, sometimes but, it works, but yeah. it's utterly unscientific. Yeah, that may be so, actually. That may be so. But then there's that quality of the body as a laboratory. Well, it's better than nothing, for sure, but yeah. it very often goes the wrong direction. Uh, caller, thank you for your call. Um, I guess we should move. Oh, you know, it, it, you know, let me ask you something. If people were to experiment with losing... A lot of people are supplementing with essential fats like primrose oil and flaxseed oil and everything because it makes them feel better. When I asked you about that initially, you said because it has an inhibitory effect on the immune system and so you get less inflamed because of that. How would you stop taking something like that if it's making you feel better? Fish oils are the ones that are more effective Uh anti-inflammatory agents, but uh, there's a generalized anti-immune function such that they used to sell emulsions for intravenous use of uh, vegetable oils as uh, feeding for cancer patients, but since it made the patients die faster, then they discovered that it was destroying their immune systems. Now they use the very same emulsions for organ transplant patients just because it does suppress immunity. Mm. Okay, so basically maybe uh, up the fish oils, get rid of the other stuff as a transitional thing, possibly. Anyway, let's, let's move to some more callers. Caller, you're on the air with KPFA. Do you have a question? Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes, I've had chronic fatigue syndrome for um, 15 years. Do you have any information that might help me? Um, yeah, very often it starts with either thyroid or beans in the diet. Or beans? Yep. Beans are a very common 
a dietary factor. Uh, uh -huh. They contain antigens that uh, make, make them a more complex toxin that uh, cause the liver and the intestine and the thyroid to malfunction. And uh, you can break the cycle sometimes just with diet, but uh -huh. usually thyroid is an important thing to consider. Okay. Hunter gather diet. Go into this. I, uh, I think I've talked about it in newsletters. One called the Bean Syndrome, uh, which involves muscle soreness as well as chronic fatigue. Uh, uh -huh. Several people have written about it in the past, but uh, can people get back issues of your yeah. newsletters? I, I don't like to mention oh, okay. that because okay. it takes a long time to find the back okay. issues. What about uh, Nutrition for Women, your book? Does it talk about it there? Um, no, I think the progesterone book is the, the one people should start with. Okay. Caller, thank you for your call. Thank you. Let's move to another. Caller, you're on the air. Um, yeah, I wasn't listening to the beginning of the show, so I don't know whether you spoke about this, but when you're talking about um, treating low thyroid, how do you treat it? Oh, boy. <laughs> I don't know if we can give you a short answer. We've got a lot of people waiting to call in. It depends on where you're starting from, sometimes four ounces of orange juice every hour through the day for several days is all it takes to uh, activate the thyroid. Sometimes it takes adding eggs or milk to the diet. If you're uh, not allergic. De yeah, depending on what the limiting factor is in your thyroid problem. Sometimes one dose of progesterone can uh, break a person out of the cycle. Sometimes uh, dropping out vegetable oils or beans or nuts or seeds is all it takes. Yeah, switching to a higher protein diet with without those mm -hmm. items in it. And low grain, too. The grain is irritating as well. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, caller, thank you. Um, let's move on. Caller, are you there? Go ahead, please. Hey. Um, I'm, we're having some... Hello? Yeah, are you there? Oh, yeah. Gee, I didn't know. Oh, great. Okay. okay. Go ahead, please. Um, hello, can you hear? Hello? Yes, yeah, please uh, go ahead. Do you have have you done any research on the connection between high estrogen levels and fibroid tumors oh, or sure. and obesity? Of course. Sure, that was uh, well documented by 1950. Alexander Lipshoot and his group showed that the very smallest, incredibly small dose of estrogen that he used, if it was allowed to act continuously without interruption by pregnenolone or progesterone or thyroid was first pro produced uh, fibromas in the uterus, then the breast, then the intestine, uh, then the fibromas tended to progress eventually to cancer of every organ. He was one of the people who documented the natural history of estrogen-induced cancers, and fibromas are just an early influence of estrogen primarily in the uterus and breast but ultimately in all connective tissues and other types of cell. What, what can you do about it? Uh, thyroid is the basic thing. I've had people get into a slightly hyperthyroid state taking a good balanced thyroid supplement and month by month they have documented that the thyroid alone is able to shrink the uh, uterine fibroid. Really? Without using progesterone? Yeah, the progesterone was tested and does work, but partly it works through the um, thyroid, and the essential thing is to take enough thyroid to get your estrogen way down, even below normal for a while. Where do you get it? Do you have to go to the doctor? Yeah, you do, and that's going to be an interesting argument. I don't even want to hear that argument. Um, caller, thank you for your call. Good thank, luck. Thank you. I, I actually have I've heard of people just changing, in my experience with clients that I've had, just changing their diet and getting rid of the grains, getting the protein up, getting rid of the beans, getting rid of the soy, and getting them on some supplemental progesterone I, yep. I, has worked. That's ultimately the best thing, but if they're in a hurry to have a baby or something, they can speed it up. You with. have to get some black market thyroid. <laughs> All right, let's take just one or two more quick calls. Caller, you're on the air. Um, hi, I was just wondering, I missed the very beginning of the show, and what... What in what relation are you talking about the thyroid right now? Well, you know what, we're not going to be able to go back because okay, it's okay. way too. But you can order a tape of the show, and if you take my number down at the end, okay. Well, then I've got a question. Okay. Um, I eat a very a diet very high in beans and grains, and I've been experiencing 
um, lots of fatigue. Right. That's um, what we've been talking thyroid about. Thyroid symptoms. I, my thyroid has been kind of, I've been noticing it, which is unusual. Uh, Ray, did you pay this guy? <laughs> <laughs> um, a, a few weeks ago, there was an article in the newspaper about China having 25 million Cretans and 100 million hypothyroid people at least. And uh, just a couple days after that article, someone said, but, but you say soy is poisonous because it's estrogenic and anti-thyroid. What about all the Asians? And I said, yeah, it's proven that it causes a hypothyroidism. Caller, I, I've made it my mission since I've been on the radio to get people to look at this problem. It's not that I have some kind of, of, of moral thing about vegetarian diets. I've mm -hmm. just found that they're not entirely healthy for everyone. Well, yeah, I'm not, I'm not entirely vegetarian. I do eat meat still yeah. occasionally. Yeah. It's, it's well, you can experiment with dropping the beans uh -huh. and pulling back on the vegetable oils and certainly not cooking with vegetable oils and eating yeah, more I primarily potatoes and stuff. Oil. Yeah, don't do that. Okay. Um, Ordinary potatoes, especially if they're fried in coconut oil, are often fantastically therapeutic for people with a dietary problem. That's a long story, but potatoes no, have yeah. an extremely high-quality protein. What do you think of protein supplements? You know what? We're not going to have. We're going to have to. I'll let Ray answer you real quick, but okay. we run out of time. Okay. They're generally <laughs> produced under oxidative conditions that damage the protein seriously. So. Uh, you can better get, to skip it. You can get yeah. much better protein, much cheaper yeah. from um, natural milk and eggs or potatoes. We're going to have to stop. I don't want to stop, but we have to stop. <laughs> Ray Pete, uh, we've given out a PO box for him. It's at the front desk of KPFA. If people need it, you can call eight four eight six seven six seven. Ray, thank you so much. We're going to have to have you back if you're willing to do well, it. Sure. Okay. Thanks again. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye for now. Bye. I'm Lena Berman. And I want to thank you for listening. If you need more information or want a cassette copy of this or any other in the series, Your Own Health and Fitness, you can call my information number 24 hours a day at 707-874-2772. For a list of other available shows, information about guests and news about the nonprofit and the benefits of, me of membership, and to listen to the show free online, go to the website, yourownhealthandfitness.org. Your Own Health and Fitness is a joint production of Your Own Health and Fitness and KPFA-FM. The engineer for Your Own Health and Fitness is Vinnie Beecham. Remember, being informed not only protects your health, it protects your freedom.